Many people might not know that the famous riots of 1992 in Los Angeles were in fact a remake. The original Watts riots of 1965 were a less star-studded affair, but in many ways they were the big bang of rap music. After a police confrontation following the harassment of a black motorist, things escalated into a fight and reports of a pregnant woman being beaten by police began to circulate, and before long rioting and looting had broken out in the city for six days. Friday, for the first time, there was widespread looting and rioting in broad daylight. You'd see happy, laughing looters toting off furniture, clothing, even outboard motors. Finally, seven hours after Police Chief William Parker asked for the National Guard, Lieutenant Governor Glenn Anderson ordered in 2,000 troops. The impact on LA was pure devastation. 34 people lost their lives, over a thousand were injured, and the city sustained $40 million in damages, which doesn't sound too bad, but considering the fact this was 1965, that would be over $300 million in today's prices. Four months were spent creating a report into what caused the riot, and whilst unrest in this impoverished community was identified as a cause of the riot, very little effort was made to actually fix the problems that were going on in Watts and other areas of Los Angeles. In the face of lacking government support for the inner cities following the riots, a man named Bud Schulberg decided to help in the only way that he knew how, by starting the Watts Writers Workshop. I said, I'm only one person, but I, I, uh, as a writer, maybe I could, maybe I could start a writing class. So I did. I, I simply put up a, a notice saying, a creative writing class every Wednesday, three o'clock. The workshop provided an outlet for young African-American artists in Watts and the surrounding areas to have a voice and express themselves creatively. I smile. I'm here. I'm glad I'm here despite the bit of pain and fear. The pain feels good. And the Watts Writers Workshop eventually received funding from several different bodies, including the Rockefeller Foundation. Peace to the Rock. And from these writers' workshops emerged a group called the Watts Prophets, a spoken word street performance clique from Texas and Louisiana. Their 1971 record, Rap in Black in a White World, was one of the earliest references to the word rapping. But to be honest, it didn't really resemble rapping as we know it today, and it was a lot closer to rhythmic spoken word poetry and song. The Watts Prophets were sampled by and influenced an enormous wave of contemporary big name rappers, including Snoop Dogg, who talked about their influence in his Nardwar interview. You mentioned Watts in it. What can you tell the people about the Watts Prophets and their rapper? Wow, oh, you got the Watts Prophets album? This is heavy. The work of the Watts Prophets was pretty hard-hitting social commentary. Their poetry rallied against injustice against the black community, and in many ways, their words still hold up to this day. Their music's a far cry from modern rap music. In fact, listening to one of their projects, I didn't once hear the sound skirt. I suppose ad-libs kind of undercut a serious political message. I guess that's why Bernie Sanders fired that hype man. Support that idea as well. Skirt. All right, four years ago, we were talking about- Four years. The ugliness, Ooh. vulgarity Bains. of the United States having more people in jail, jail. than any other country on earth. Okay. Disproportionately African-American, Latino, and Native American. Squad. And we said that maybe instead of investing in jails the 12. and incarceration, we should invest in our young people in jobs and education. Rex. However, beyond the phrase rap as a form of poetry, hip-hop in Los Angeles began to take shape around the 70s, when a young DJ from Compton by the name of Alonzo Williams began performing under the name Disco Construction. Alonzo Williams has been referred to as the godfather of West Coast hip-hop. A West Coast Wiley, if you will. Williams partnered with another DJ called Roger Clayton, but the two would eventually part ways. Williams would go on to start the group, the World Class Wrecking Crew, which you may remember was the original group that Dr. Dre and DJ Yellow were part of before founding NWA. The group were actually famously known for wearing glam rock-esque clothing, which was reportedly part of the reason why Dr. Dre actually lost interest in the group and left. And of course, Dr. Dre's feminine outfits were famously mocked by Easy e later on when he referred to Dr. Dre as a she thing. Man, if Easy e saw what Lil Uzi Vert was wearing these days, he'd roll in his fucking grave. But Alonzo's business partner, Roger Clayton, would go on to start the DJ group, Uncle Jam's Army. And they would go on to become one of the biggest DJ groups in Los Angeles, eventually going on to sell out huge venues like the LA Coliseum. Around this time, the music scene was focused a lot more on DJing than rapping, which caused hip hop to have a much closer affinity with the electro music scene and breakdancing. Another landmark was in 1982, when Duffy and Jerry Hooks launched the Rapper's Rap record label, the first LA rap label that was inspired by the Sugar Hill Gang success over in New York. Their first act, Captain Rap, dropped his single The Gigolo Rap in 1981, but this failed to get any big traction. 
But the captain continued steering his lyrical ship across the open waters of early hip hop, and two years later had more success with the song Bad Times, a politically conscious response to Grandmaster Flash's The Message. However, in contrast to the socially conscious writing of, say, The Watts Prophets, or to a lesser extent, the later work of Captain Rap, the earliest foundations of gangster rap emerged in the mid 80s with the likes of Compton Posse, started by Mixmaster Spade. Spade went on to mentor future stars such as Toddy T, who'd had an early hit in 1985 with his song The Bataram, an ode to the classic move of the cops smashing in your door with a long stick, as was immortalized in the movie Straight Outta Compton. Now that's how you pull up with a stick. By the mid 80s, things were heating up and the seeds of NWA's gangster rap success were finally being sown. Alonzo Williams of the world-class wrecking crew founded Crew Cut Records and built a recording studio in the back of his nightclub, Eves After Dark. And this is where Eazy e and Jerry Heller would actually set up Ruthless Records. However, LA rap and hip hop in general in the 80s weren't quite as developed as they needed to be to get mainstream attention. I think Donald Glover summed it up best. Have you ever listened to rap back in the day? It's always some dude being like, well, I went to the hat store today and I bought myself a hat. <laughs> but that was all about to change with the introduction of the greatest innovation in hip hop history. No, I'm not talking about the ad lib skirt. I'm talking about gangster rap. For the longest time, iced tea was just a delicious beverage. However, in the early 1980s, Ice-T the rapper emerged, mainly rapping over electro beats as early as 1983 with his song, The Coldest Rap. But it was his 1986 track, Six in the Morning, that's often hailed as the first gangster rap song of all time. The track describes a harrowing story of him having to escape the cops early in the morning. Though Ice-T himself proclaims that his biggest influence for this song was Schooly D, the Philadelphia rapper who made the song PSK, What Does It Mean, which is often considered the very first gangster rap song of all time. PSK stands for Parkside Killers, a Philadelphia gang hellbent on ruining picnics all over the city. But whoever you think started it, gangster rap was carried forward by acts all over the United States. But the true explosion of gangster rap would happen in 1988 when NWA dropped their groundbreaking album Straight Outta Compton. Compton as a place was immortalized by NWA's tracks and to a lesser extent, fellow early Compton rapper King T. And of course later Compton or Bompton was immortally entrenched in hip hop history through Soldier Boy's recent antics. Who ain't from Fruits? Who ain't from Fruit Time? I'm walking through Bompton right now, I'm in my hood right now. When NWA rose to fame, music was finally being considered as dangerous and bad, and not in the Michael Jackson sense of the words. When the track Fuck the Police dropped, the FBI were famously fuming, and even sent the crew a letter expressing their concern over public safety due to the song, and several efforts were made to ban the crew. We'll put you on tour, but you can't perform that song. Cops everywhere, they ready to shut you down. We was like, tonight, we gonna do that song. The whole Detroit Police Department rushed the stage. But it seemed like no amounts of public outrage were enough to ban gangster rap or NWA. And the perceived danger of the genre only seemed to stoke interest and excitement all over the country. It threatened criminal prosecution if the stores continue to sell the new NWA record to minors. This is uh, frankly offensive to me and uh, I think to any parent that uh, uh, would uh, hear uh, and would know what these lyrics are all about, they would find that it is nothing but filth. But this kind of controversy sure was good at selling records, and N.W.A.'s E. Phil for Zaggin album ended up becoming the first gangster rap album to go number one in the United States. This put gangster rap and LA hip hop at the forefront of music all over the world. And it was also around this time that Latino rappers were also allowed to flourish, including the likes of Kid Frost, who came through with his hit record, La Raza, which you might actually recognize from the Grand Theft Auto San Andreas soundtrack. And interestingly, Kid Frost himself actually voiced the character T-Bone Mendez in that same video game. What are you, Rato stupid? Someone's on to us. We need to go back and rethink. And beyond Kid Frost, in 1991, fellow Latin rap legend Cypress Hill came through with their hit tune, how I Could Just Kill A Man. That track would take them jumping around on tour with fellow LA party rap click House of Pain, and it would also end up on the soundtrack to San Andreas as well. But from here, things begun to evolve beyond gangster rap. And since his departure from NWA, Ice Cube's solo efforts begun taking the genre in a much more socio-political direction. Cube took aim at institutional racism, inner city poverty, and people with stutters with his controversial album, America Cuz Most Wanted. Meanwhile, it was Dr. Dre that was truly revolutionizing the gangster rap sound and bringing it 
hit to a mainstream audience with his monster hit album The Chronic, released with the help of Suge Knight over at Death Row Records. Dr. Dre popularised the G-Funk sound as well as excessive weed smoking with this album that actually featured the debut for fellow G-Funk legend Nate Dogg. However, at this point it would be fair to give an honourable mention to the LA crew above the law who actually claimed to have invented the G-Funk sound during the period when Dr. Dre was working with them over at Easy es Ruthless Records. KMG, go KMG. ahead. KMG, KMG from above the law. Yes. Rest in peace. Yeah. Okay. He wrote, a, he wrote a verse and he said, uh, a P-Funk cake wakes me up every morning. Yeah. For whatever reason, I said, say G-Funk. Right. We didn't know we was naming nothing. That's yeah. Right. He just put it in a rhyme and we kept referring back to it and then we realized, it is G-Funk. Mm -hmm. So even if you believe Above the Law were the people that got the G-Funk sound off of the ground, it was Dr. Dre that truly got it bouncing and moving in a three-wheel motion. And when Dr. Dre and Suge Knight discovered Snoop Dogg, G-Funk would finally take over the entire scene. Snoop Dogg had actually started out his career as part of a crew called the 213 with fellow G-Punk pioneers Nate Dogg and Warren G. Around the early days when Snoop Dogg was hustling with the 213, one of his early freestyle demo tapes managed to end up in the hands of Dr. Dre, who was immediately impressed took Snoop Dogg under his wing and mentored him, eventually producing some of his biggest hits of his career. It was time to do my first solo album, The Chronic. Yeah! I had no idea how I was gonna do it, how I was gonna get done, and then boom, here comes Snoop, right? Uh, the true diamond in the rough, I mean, Snoop is just pure, raw talent. Nobody sounds like Snoop. And then when he opens his mouth, you know exactly who it is, you feel me? No, not only that, but his style of charisma made me feel like he was destined to be a superstar. Snoop Dogg came out of the gate with a huge career debut on the song Deep Cover with Dr. Dre for the movie of the same name. And after appearing on Nothing But A G Thing, the first single from Dr. Dre's chronic album, the foundations were set for big moves from Snoop Dogg from there on out. From there, he dropped the monster hits Who Am I and Gin and Juice from his huge debut album Doggy Style. And from there on out, Dre and Snoop would dominate the charts with the G-Funk sound. The Chronic hit number three on Billboard and went triple platinum. Doggy Style came in at number one, went quadruple platinum, and ended up selling over 11 million copies worldwide. That's a hell of a lot of gin, juice, and weed sold. But if Dre and Snoop were rapping gangster, then it was Suge Knight that was truly living gangster. Prior to the success of The Chronic, the biggest financial windfall that Suge Knight had had for Death Row Records was landing $4 million from Vanilla Ice in exchange for not tossing him off a balcony. But as the Death Row Records empire grew, so did Suge Knight's reputation as a savage enforcer. At the age of only 30, and with a lengthy criminal record, including three felony convictions, Suge Knight has managed to become the head of a $100 million record company and one of the most powerful and feared men in the American music industry. A watershed moment in hip hop came at the 1995 Source Awards, when Suge Knight took the stage and decided to insult his East Coast rival Puff Daddy from Bad Boy Records, saying that anybody who didn't want their executives singing all over the songs and dancing all over the videos should come to death row. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, and don't want to, and want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on a record, dancing, come to death row. This was a huge inciting incident for the East Coast, West Coast hip hop rivalries that were raging after LA based Tupac had been shot outside of a recording session in New York that he'd blamed the notorious B.I.G. for. Interestingly, it was that same speech at the 1995 Source Awards where Suge Knight also shouted out Tupac in an attempt to curry favor with the West Coast legend. I'd like to tell Tupac, keep his guards up, we ride with him. And only months after this did Suge Knight secure the bag for Tupac, posting a $1.4 million bond to secure Tupac's bail after a sexual assault charge. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for just destroying everything I worked for for the past 22 years and a happy new year to you too. You did your job. I'm out of money. I'm out of uh, all my resources. You made me look like the bad guy in my own community. Can you move this down to your left, please? Tupac took this bail money in exchange for signing to Death Row Records and quite frankly, in my opinion, signed a deal with the devil. Well, it's not really fair to compare Suge Knight to the devil. I mean, would the devil wear an outfit like this? Yeah, he probably would actually. The Death Row era would unfortunately mark the final act in Tupac's wild career journey. Whilst Tupac wasn't actually from LA, he'd moved there from Baltimore after growing up in New York. Over the years, he'd pioneered socially conscious rap through tracks like Brenda's Got a Baby, celebrated for being some of the best examples of hip hop tracks highlighting social injustice. And still to this day, he's made some of the most impactful music in hip hop history. It was during his time at Death Row Records where he dropped the classic California anthem, California Love, with fellow Death Row artist Dr. Dre. And Pac was clearly raking in the money for Suge Knight, with his Death Row released album, All Eyes On Me, going down as an instant classic. 
It went five time platinum in two months and charted at number one on the Billboard chart, along with California Love and How Do You Want It, both being number one hits under Death Row Records. Unfortunately, the good times wouldn't last, and within a year of signing to Death Row Records, Tupac would be tragically gunned down in Las Vegas in a drive-by shooting. Rap star Tupac Shakur died last night after a brief life in a rough business. He was 25. The shooting had happened just after a fight had gone down in Las Vegas that involved both Pac and Suge Knight. Suge Knight actually ended up getting sentenced to nine years in jail following a conviction on this fight due to the fact he was still on probation for a previous assault with a firearm. Unfortunately, Biggie Smalls would also die around six months later in a drive-by shooting in Los Angeles. Rapper Biggie Smalls was shot to death in Los Angeles early this morning while leaving a party. His death comes almost exactly six months to the day that another rapper, Tupac Shakur, was fatally shot in Las Vegas. The shooting followed a music industry party celebrating the Soul Train Music Awards, where Notorious B.I.G. performed last year. All of this drama put increased attention on Death Row's empire and showed the devastating effects of gangster rap beats that spilled into the streets. And by this point, the stink on Suge Knight was far too powerful to ignore. Dr. Dre had already left Death Row Records a few months earlier after growing disillusioned with the thug life mentality of many of Suge Knight's goons that had been around at all times. Snoop Dogg's second album, The Dogfather, was released on Death Row Records not long after Tupac's death. And whilst this strictly gangster outing did go platinum, by this point, Snoop also wanted out of Death Row's evil empire. But because Snoop was on a tight, time-based contract, he opted to simply produce no tracks for Death Row Records until his contract was finally up and he was free. Interestingly, from this point on, Snoop Dogg toned down the more gangster elements of his music. And after beating his long pending murder charge, he decided to distance himself from the gangster rap lifestyle. It was like, a certain part of my life in which I, I, I took the wrong route, more or less, and drifted into the into the wrong side of life. But I mean, I was blessed enough to bank back off of that and still be alive and get a chance to do something positive. And I took that chance and did what I had to do. And in the years that follow, LA rap began to lose steam. Don't get me wrong, the biggest names in the scene did manage to cling onto relevance through the late 90s and into the noughties. Dre, Exhibit, Ice Cube, and Snoop Dogg all continued to release big projects. But for a while, hip hop was just being dominated by rappers from other regions. Whilst Suge Knight was locked up in jail and in the aftermath of Biggie's death, P. Diddy's Bad Boy records continued to flourish in New York alongside other New York artists like the Wu-Tang Clan and Jay-Z. But it was still LA legend Dr. Dre that would have the biggest hand in bringing through some of the most groundbreaking artists in hip hop all over the country over the turn of the millennium. And even though he hailed from the rough parts of Detroit, it was actually in Los Angeles where Eminem would compete in the Rap Olympics and his mixtape would fall in the hands of Dr. Dre, who would become his mentor. For a moment, everyone had forgotten about Dre, but he was still representing for the gangsters all across the world. So after bringing Eminem from a trailer in 8 Mile in 1999 to winning an Oscar for Lose Yourself in 2003. The Oscar goes to Eminem, Jeff Bass, and Luis Rusto for Lose Yourself from 8 Mile. And whilst in the process of reviving 50 Cent's career after he'd received a nine bullet buffet, Dre quietly mentored an LA rapper who would bring the city of Los Angeles back to life musically, the game. Often when I hear the game, the first thing I think about is painting my fingernails black and harassing women at Whole Foods. But the rap of the game was born in Compton to two parents that were primarily Crips living in the Crip-controlled Santana block. Unfortunately, to the disappointment of his folks, he grew up to be a blood. You think telling your parents you want to do a liberal arts degree is bad? Try telling your Crip parents that you want to be a blood. But after getting shot in 2001, the game decided to use music as a route out of the gangster lifestyle. The success of his first mixtape, You Know What It Is, Volume 1, in 2002, got him his first taste of industry attention. But by 2003, the game was signing a deal with fellow LA legend Dr. Dre and fellow connoisseur of shitty overpriced headphones Jimmy IV. But Dre would make a move that would end up eventually becoming terminal when he attempted to expedite the game's rise to fame by placing him in G-Unit with 50 Cent. The game had a cameo in 50 Cent's music video for Inder Club, Dancing With Some Chick. Keep your hands to yourself, game. This early appearance would seem to suggest that the game was around long before 50 Cent became the megastar that we know him as today. While 50 Cent rose to the top, the game continued working behind the scenes whilst getting mentored by Dr. Dre for the next two and a half years. Eventually, when the time and buzz were right, Dr. Dre oversaw the release of the game's smash hit album, The Documentary, which went double platinum and brought LA rap back to the forefront of the music industry. The game's rise to fame brought a lot of eyeballs back to LA, and local legends like Snoop Dogg, Exhibit, and Ice Cube all put out projects around this time to capitalize on the growing West Coast buzz. And despite his high profile and bitter falling out with 50 Cent and G-Unit, the game's buzz continued, and he went down as one of the biggest artists LA rap had ever seen. And how fitting is it for the man that put LA back on the map to have a face like a you are here sign. In the 
years that followed the game's gangster rap revival, other forms of music began to bubble in Los Angeles. Dr. Dre famously bought the next lyrical powerhouse in Los Angeles, Kendrick Lamar under his wing, following KDOT's discovery by LA mogul Anthony Tissus, aka Top Dog of TDE, Top Dog Entertainment, Kendrick's record label. And the success of Kendrick and his black hippie clan of cronies, including J-Rock, Schoolboy Q, and Absol, ushered in an era of almost post-gangster conscious LA hip-hop. But in contrast to Kendrick's talent, which has undeniably been recognized by the mainstream hip-hop and music industry, but it would actually be in 2007 when Tyler the Creator's Odd Future Collective would emerge, bringing alternative hipster rap to the forefront of LA music culture. Hip-hop and the line outside the Supreme store would never be the same again. Tyler and Odd Future's unique approach to production, as well as not taking everything so goddamn seriously on the mic, was a breath of fresh air to the rap game. In fact, for a hot minute, Tyler completely took over hip-hop in 2011 when he dropped his smash single Yonkers and ended up bringing home the trophy for Best New Artist at the 2011 VMAs. Tyler, the creator. I wanted this since I was nine. I'm about to cry. In fact, it was actually around this time that party rap began to re-emerge on the LA hip hop scene, especially around the time that the Cali Swag District taught everyone how to duggy and brought back hip hop dance culture to Los Angeles once and for all. But it was actually everybody's favorite DJ and nobody's favorite dip, DJ Mustard, who brought to the forefront the ratchet sound in hip hop, taking LA back to those funky, fun times of music, giving the scene a similar vibe that it had back in the 80s. The watershed moment for ratchet music in Los Angeles was when Tiger dropped Rack City around 2011. In fact, Rack City was really a big moment in Tiger's career, putting him musically back on the map after having spent several years living in the shadows of young money and not getting paid by Birdman. It didn't take much time for the ratchet sound to take over LA as well as hip hop at large. In fact, before long, you'd be hard pressed to find a strip club in the United States where you couldn't clap cheeks whilst hearing the drop, Mustard on a beat hole. Oh. And Mustard's influence spread through LA like a fluorescent yellow liquid on a danger dog made of musical meat. An entire new wave of legendary LA rappers emerged out of the renewed mainstream interest in the commercial sound of LA music. YG dropped his big debut, My Crazy Life, featuring extensive production from DJ Mustard. Hell, even Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber decided to vulture the culture and jump on DJ Mustard beats of their own. And I'd argue in many ways that it was actually DJ Mustard that brought back the fun, commercial party sound to hip hop that it desperately needed to fully take over the mainstream. And I'd argue that in many ways, DJ Mustard's sound is exactly what the hip hop scene needed to bring back that commercial sound and take it to the forefront of music in general. And it was this renewed energy that's allowed the entire current wave of huge LA rap artists to dominate the scene for the last five years. Whether it's Ty Dolla Sign, Kid Ink, Nipsey Hussle, or even more recently, Roddy Rich, it's that fun California party sound that has given so many big LA artists enormous hits in the past few years. So, my time in LA was over. I know some people think that the story of LA hip hop isn't my story to tell. The place where I grew up is more grey showers than Watts Towers. But one of the most beautiful things to happen to hip hop over the past 20 years is just how far its influence has managed to reach. So, before you tear someone down for being a culture vulture, take a second to celebrate just how many people from different backgrounds all over the world have grown up to love and cherish hip hop. Maybe the Watts Prophets, NWA, and even DJ Mustard might never have imagined that their art could have traveled to the shores of rainy old England. And sometimes, even thousands of miles from Long Beach or Venice, if you listen close enough, you can look out onto the ocean of Bognor Regis and hear the echoes of ad-libs gone by. Sk